what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, let us take a breath. Okay. And just think about stuff a little bit. So when it comes to working with technology in general, um, it's easy to run towards what the functionalities we want without understanding how the technology works. Now, I come from a background of IT, so I've been working in the world of bringing technology and, and consumers together, and that was my life for a very long time, and understanding consumer dynamics and, and customer experience. Now I do that in my job, so when the shit hits the fan, people call me, and tonight I'm here to say, well, when the shit hits the fan, there's always a solution, all right? So, um, pardon my French for the people that know that word. Um, so... What I did at the GSS is we talked about how does these technology elements work. So, but I did it in a specific way. So I'm going to try and do it the same way tonight, but I do not have a physical environment the same way set up that I had at the conference. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of trial and error because I also realized that I'm in Zoom at the moment, which means my computer is already attached all its my visual elements to zoom and so for me to break those connections now and get in a different way is a little bit tricky so i've had to rig up some stuff but uh, i think we can go so the first thing i want to explain to you is that whenever we look at a t computer screen or at a video screen what makes it easier for us to understand that paradigm is to put it in a frame of reference that makes sense to us so for most of us, TV makes sense because for years and years, as we grew up, we've seen people on TV. So what are the things that we know in TV? When you're a presenter on TV, there's only two to three fingers at the top of the screen. So all of you look at your picture and see how far you are from the top of the screen and see if you can position yourself better. All right. So Michelle. Screen needs to come down a little bit. You know, I've said this before, right? <laughs> there we go. Perfect. All right. And so the other thing that's handy is as South Africans, yeah, Tony, yours can move with, move a little bit down. The, the thing is with the automated tools, Tony, what you were talk, talking about is a lot of them will position you in the middle of the screen, which doesn't quite feel that comfortable. It feels like people got to uh, just, just, I just want to see the rest of your face. All right. And so the other thing is when we're presenting, we want to make sure that our hands are shown and we can, and because all of us gesture, I mean, South Africans, we're, we're gesture happy. And Tony, you know, Southern Europeans and South Americans are also gesture happy, right? So we always like to say things like I was explaining to people earlier, the sign for I'm sorry is this, which is one of the first I learned recently. And I love you. So I'm sorry. And I love all of you. It's fine. Okay. So the next thing is, so anytime that you stand up, for instance, from the elbows upwards, if that is visible, it feels comfortable. Next time you look at the TV, look at how people are framed. Framing is probably one of the most important things you can do. It depends on, do we want this to be an intimate conversation where it's only the face and we use the facial expressions when we talk to someone? Or are we going to be animated and gesture and go nuts and make sure we sit up a little bit straight to get the head at the top? You know, how do we frame it? And framing gives us a sense of intimacy. It gives us a sense of, is this broadcast TV? You know, how formal it is and all those kind of things we can do with that. So framing is our first thing to remember. Framing in a hotel room is also interesting because all I need behind me for one half is the curtain that usually hangs by the window that's usually a blackout curtain that's going to make the room nice and dark, all right? So from this side to that side, it's all curtain. And on this side, there's going to be a wall or vice versa. So all of a sudden, I've positioned myself in a corner. The moment I've created a corner, I've created depth. The moment I have something behind me, I can go slightly off center, put a little bedside table back there and get... A flower from downstairs at reception, you say, well, can I steal one of these lilies just for an hour or two? And you say, well, could you maybe organize me a vase or something? They're always willing to help, you know. Um, if you're nice, you know, Tim Gard already said, you know, be nice to people in a hotel. You get the most amazing deals. So what I then do is just put a vase back there, one lily sticking up behind me. And all of a sudden, I've got a set. 
Now I can play. It's not just me, but I create life in the picture. So why do I need to be close to a curtain? Because although I may be framed and I'm starting to think about my background, I also need to understand that sound reflects off hard surfaces. So if I open up the curtain, the window becomes a hard surface that's going to echo the sound. All right. So you guys will hear here with me, there's not much of an echo. Why is that? Because behind me is a hanging bit of vinyl. To the side of me here, I've got curtains. And to the side of me here, I've got curtains. I'm going to show you guys what this looks like in a second. All right. And so I want the sound not to echo. Now, if you're worried about writing all of this stuff down and not going to be able to remember everything, I put a Google link twice already in the chat group. If you open that up, there's a PowerPoint presentation that I could have given this from, but I want to show you guys practically. And there's also another PDF that is my short list recommendation for hardware um, on lighting and cameras and microphones and things like that. And if you ever want to spend money, call me. I'll tell you what to spend the money on and especially what not to spend the money on, okay? So let's have a quick look at what's going to, I'm going to quickly dress the set, just my background. I don't have any plants in here, but I've got something different. Now what you might see here is I've taken a plank. Whoops, something is falling. There we go. And yeah, I'm a bit of a geek. Whoops. I have a toolboxes, you know, sort of like the stuff you put your drills and hammers and all that kind of stuff in, and they're on little wheels. So they're made by a company called Thanos. You don't have to worry about that. You can use a crate that you get, a tomato crate or a beer crate that you get from a local supermarket. Doesn't matter. Something you can just create height on. Put a black piece of cloth over it so nobody can see what happens below. So as you can see, because I'm sitting over here, you can now see that this is a crate. All right. But all this is a plank from a local hardware store. On top of that, I put some book books. This I bought secondhand at a um, at a secondhand market, like a thrift store. And over here, I've got a little bit of concrete which I poured around um, around a little a light socket, and so I've got a light bulb in there. All right, cheap ass little shade of it. Okay, so. What is special about that? Everything is cheap on there except the light bulb. The light bulb in there is the most expensive thing I bought. Now, the reason I bought that is because it's from a brand called Aperture. And Aperture makes really amazing lights that are color accurate. But this one is special because when the power fails, as we know it happens in South Africa, right, that light will probably run for about an hour in any color of the rainbow because it charges when the battery when the light is on or when the power is on and when the power switches off it just keeps on burning so if you're in the middle of a presentation and the power fails and you still have internet because that's the other thing eh? um, you can keep on presenting so that is a small investment i would consider i know for south africans it's a rather big investment they're about a hundred dollars for for a light bulb which is I think expensive, all right. Um, but I've got three of them, so over there I've also got some lamp lampshades. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to my mobile phone. So I have my mobile phone currently connected over here. Can you guys see that? Okay, that's my cute husband, okay? So, um, but let's scroll away from him very quickly because that's not what we're here for, right? Um, so let's go to the camera. And I'm just going to swap the camera sideways. There are other ways of doing this as well, which we can talk about in a second. But I just want to show you, it's not about bragging about the whole setup. It's more a case of I want to show you what it looks like when you basically have a door over there. And all I did is I put a moving blanket in front of the door to trap the sound so it doesn't travel into the hallway. And it also, because it's heavy, it means it removes a lot of the sound from outside. You guys know there's little things, the little dog sand filled with beans and so on that you normally put in front of the door? 
get a nice long one or make a sausage out of it so you can put it at the bottom of the door to cover the, the slit at the bottom of the door. I've also put in little, in the door frame, I've put in um, rubberizing. So obviously we can't do this in a hotel room, but this is a cheap studio at home. Okay. So at the bottom of it, I don't need that because I've built it into the door, but that's a special thing we get here in the Netherlands a lot called the fall door pull, but you can just put that little sausage dog at the bottom with the bean bag. All right. So what I also did is I put in some curtain rails. You see them there at the top, the curtain rails? All right. And I just hung the cheapest bit of cotton that I could find off that. But I got somebody to do a seam for me at the bottom, and I just put a little chain, which I bought at the hardware store, so it's always hanging flat down. All right. So why do I want white and or... Eh, there we go, black cloth in my studio because light material absorbs sound. So it makes it sound a little bit more dull so that you don't get echoes. Heavy materials create insulation from the outside world. So it insulates what we say from the outside world so they don't hear us, but it also stops the sounds coming from the outside into our room. So... That means when we look at when we look at sound, those are the kinds of little tricks we can play to make sure that we create a room that's a bit deadened in sound. So what does that mean for a hotel room? We need to cover the door anywhere where there's, there's sound that can come in. You know, the cleaner that walks down down the hallway screaming at the other cleaner about bring me that um, that that bleach that I need for the bathroom. You don't want to hear that on your presentation to a big corporate client. So take a towel, roll it up, put it in front of the door. Simple, easy. If you want to add a bit of weight, put your suitcase against it. You know, Just think about where are the gaps and how do you dampen the sound. Another thing that I like to do in hotels is I can't have a curtain. What they do have in hotels is sheets and trolleys that they put the suitcases on or trolleys that they connect the, collect the laundry with. Those things are just high enough so that you can create a cage around you with two or three of those trolleys with sheets over them, done. You ask the hotel nicely, you usually get the stuff for free, all right? I've not had a single hotel yet that have charged me for this. I've usually given them a tip and say thank you or bought a box of chocolates to say thank you for the stuff, especially housekeeping. Be friends with housekeeping there. They're always multicultural and they're always amazing people. All right. So those are the things. When it comes to sound, how do we dress our room? Because remember, it just needs to be out of frame because nobody will know what is there. It doesn't matter how messy the room is because nobody will see anything that is not in the frame. Create some interest in the background. And we're ready to go. Now, what I've got here is horrible light. Just the light's shining from me from the top. All right. So the thing I need to do with lighting is I need to make sure that the lighting comes to me in the right space. I haven't, see, I haven't talked about cameras at all yet. I haven't talked about 4K and 6K and 8K and all this amazingly expensive stuff. This is what you can do with a mobile phone. You don't need anything more than that right now. And remember, your mobile phone is better. The camera is better than the one on your laptop. Okay. So if you want to get that quality into your computer, there are different ways of doing it. What I just showed you is a slightly more expensive way because I brought it in through a, um, you, an HDMI connection. But I will show you on my mobile phone, there's a little cable that I can have an HDMI connection on. And that HDMI connector there, let me just put it in front of my face so it zooms. There we go. On that HDMI connector, next to it, I've got a power connector. So my phone keeps on charging. That HDMI connector, I can connect to something like an eCam that brings into my computer. I can connect that to an ATEM Mini or anything like that. Or if none of this works, I can run my camera, just my camera, to be my secondary person that I'm in the Zoom call with. So I go in there with my computer, but I go in there for my camera, for my face with this. Or if I can get my camera connected to my computer, and how do we do that? We share the data connection, right? 
So the moment I can tether my phone to my computer, they're on the same network. And the moment they're on the same network, I can use software to bring my camera's view into Zoom. It's called EPOCAM. E-P-O-C-C-A-M is from a company called Elgato, which I'm sure you've heard of before. Right. So now I haven't bought a new laptop. I still have the one that I use. Or if I don't have a laptop, I can just use my mobile phone. I can have the camera set up. I can dress my view because I can decide how I want to do it. And if I want to do that with a camera, I might need some way of holding this up. So I can use a small little tripod, tripod with a little clip on it. And there are new ones coming out now um, for Mac users where you can use, we can connect this to, um, it's, um, what is the, it's also something cam from, from Mac, but actually they brought out a clip that sits on top of your laptop and sort of slides over the top of it. So it puts the camera in the right height. So the most important thing is when we put up the camera, it needs to be eye height. So if your laptop is down here, they're always going to look up front for you. And I have a few extra pounds to the point where I'm getting surgery next year to get a few things removed. So I know what it feels like to have a double chin and turn it into quadruple chin when the camera comes from below. So just make sure you bring it up so it's eye height. And that also means you're talking to somebody as a peer. The moment they look down on you, there's an inferior relationship. The moment um, they look up at you, you're creating a superior environment, but it's also doesn't, it's not very flattering view, right? So if you have an eye height slightly above, it's fine, right? Just so that it feels like we're having a conversation and it doesn't feel like, oh my God, who are you, you know, or um, what the hell are you doing down there, you know? All right. So now we've talked a little bit about treating the room for sound. We've talked about creating interest. We've talked about framing. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is placement of your microphone. So when you guys, what you guys would have heard is I would have spoken a little bit louder as I was moving away from the microphone and it would have been more difficult to follow because I'm not near the microphone. So if I turn my head and I speak over there, again, the microphone is not picking up that great. So the, the trick with that is when, especially when we have noisy environments, the most important thing to do is the quality of the mic is less important than the placement of it. All right? So I want to put the microphone as close as I possibly can to my mouth without having it in it. All right? So as close as possible. Normally we say about 20 centimeters. All right? If you're going to have something like this which is one of those really basic microphones and you really want it really close to your mouth so you can do that radio proximity effect and unfortunately i don't have the right accent so i can get can't get Johnita all excited but i'll try <laughs> so well that's what my husband used to say to me so let's see where that goes <laughs> anyway so what you will see here is i have at the end of this, there is a gray and a white little connector. Do you see that? Now, the thing to understand about microphones is microphones is mono. It's not stereo. Okay? So if you get a normal lavalier microphone, it will not work as it is on your mobile phone because your mobile phone is both stereo and it has a, a microphone jack in it. So that single little jack there, all right, has both microphone and audio out left and right. So you need some form of converter. Now, if you're into the road, like road microphone stuff, you can get a little cable like this. And this little cable is basically going from gray to black. And black is mono and gray is stereo. Or in this case, it, you see there's actually three connectors. So you see there's three or four little silver things, okay, or copper things. So they call that a tip, a ring, a ring, and a sleeve. So you'll see that in when you're buying microphones or cables or whatever else, it'll be TRRS or TRS. Tip ring sleeve is stereo connections. Tip ring ring sleeve is stereo plus a microphone. 
So that's great. We can connect to one of those things. We can connect a microphone, but we just need to have the right one. So this specific one with a great tip from Rode is the one that is actually formulated for mobile devices. Okay, so then just makes your life a little bit easier. And so what do we expect with a mobile device? There should be a TRRS or a tip ring ring sleeve. Do you see that? Four little rings in total, the tip and three rings. Okay, so close to your mouth. Now, it sometimes we're in a loud environment, and this is great, but the loud environment is so loud that an omnidirectional mic like this one which picks up everything from everywhere, even down, is not right the right thing for us. We want to cut out some of this. So we want something more directional. So a cardio microphone is the one that we all love because the pattern looks like a heart. All right. So you know you guys know that is a heart, right? So just think of it as an upturned heart like that, because it has a little bit of a sort of rounded bit at the top at the bottom and the top is just a dome. It's almost like an upturned mushroom. You can also look at it like that. But basically, it just pick up most of the, mic the, the information from the top. So that's a cardioid mic microphone. So it just has to do with direction. So you can play with those when you think about what kind of microphone do you want. The next thing is this little thing at the tip. Yes, a lot of people call it a fluffy, all right? But it also has different names depending on the size. This, we can call, what do we call it? A, a, a dead um, bumblebee. Well, the brand name for this is called Bubble Bee, all right? And they make these small little microphones uh, covers. And inside that fluff that has got in there is made the same of the same fluff they use in parkers that they go to the South Pole and North Pole to. It starts off with very fine hair on the outside and it becomes denser and denser as it comes to the middle. These little fluffies are really expensive, but you get ones that are much cheaper. Just think about the outside is going to take all that, you know, that kind of noise. It's going to take that away, right? That, that blowing sound. So the smaller they are, they're called a dead mouse. Then you get to a dead rat. Then you get to a dead rabbit. And then you get to a dead cat. All right. So depending on the size, there's a dead something in front of it. So if you want to go anywhere and you want to get one for a lav mic, just ask them you're looking for a dead mouse to put on a lavalier microphone. The mic guys will know what you mean. The rest of the people will laugh at you. Okay. So just watching my time. Okay. So microphones we've, we've touched on now. There is a little trick. If you want to spend money on a microphone, um, two things. Rode and a lot of other companies, DJI has brought them out, Hollyland's brought them out as well, have these remote microphones, something that you clip on you and the other side you clip on your camera and you just connect to the cables on the remote pack. So I've got a few here. Let me just see if I've got one to hand. No, I'll just take it out of my box. There we go. Get them two different colors. You get black ones and white ones. All right. And all that happens is you clip this to that and you've got a microphone. You can also plug in a lav mic at the top of it. And then you've got something you can fish through your clothing, put a little tip over here, put it in the back of your belt or put it in the inside pocket of your jacket. Um, and then the other side gets connected through something like this to your mobile phone. And you can stand 100 meters, 200 meters away from that person videoing you or from where your camera is and your sound is crisp and clear. All right. And to cut out the noise, i.e. the wind noise, remember the fluffy. So that covered. Um, there's one other thing to consider in your voice. Not all of us are blessed like Tony to have an amazing voice. All right. So some of us have a voice that's slightly bassier and we want it to sound a little bit brighter. So then we need to make sure that the microphone we have just has at the top end, there's a little bit more room. You see on the graphs that they have, there's a little bump. So in this slide deck that I've made available to you guys, it takes you through those graphs and show you what those graphs look like. So just look for them in any documentation, the microphone, you'll find them. 
if you have a rather reedy voice, so some men have a slightly reedier and higher pitched voice, but want to create a bit more bass character, then look at the bottom end of the scale, usually around about 50 hertz and, and lower. You want to create that it needs to be dropping off a little bit there. So, or have, have a bump, so it makes it make it more volume, or if it drops down, it it, 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 it cuts those bass sounds. So it, they tend to run between a certain free, certain frequencies with human voices, but everybody's voice is slightly different. Some people is a little bit more up and this others a little bit more down, and you want to balance that out a little bit so you can sound a little bit better. But that is starting to tweak things really heavily, and that also becomes a little bit more expensive when you start playing with that. Now, this microphone, which I absolutely adore, it's only hundred dollars. Okay, there are much better, nicer microphones than this, but I enjoy this one. I work well with it, and I love it. So, then the last thing we need to talk about, and Joe, do I still have my three minutes? Okay, cool. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you about is cameras. Now, there's a lot of people. Um, I have a I have a pet peeve about a, two things in when it comes to cameras. One, I I hate green screens, all right, because they never cut you out properly, and it's not the green screen's fault, all right? It is the camera's fault, because the camera cannot detect the level of detail that we need to get a proper cutout. It is not the resolution alone that matters. It is the bitrate, the how much information can be passed from the camera to your computer per second. And then only can the AI apply the green screen to it right, and understand it. So the, there's something we normally talk about 8 or 10 or 12 bit um, bits of data. And that is per pixel. And then behind that, there's a number that usually goes 400 or 420 or 422. And that has to do with how many pixels are combined to follow form one pixel. So if it says 422, it means every single picture is measured individually. If it says 420, only half the pixels are measured. Even if you say 400, only a quarter of the pixels are measured. So that means for every, so if you 4K divided by four, because that's what's being measured. Okay. And remember, 4K is a multiplication on horizontal and vertical. So it becomes quite a lot less. And so you think you've got this amazing 4K camera, but it doesn't give you that same level of depth. So there's a, if you really want to play with green screen and you really want to do it well, I think the, you should look at something called Ultimat, which is uh, the Ultimate 12 system, which is from, um, from Blackmagic. Um, it's not cheap. The Ultimate 12 Mini that just came out um, is the cheapest I've seen that is really living amazing quality. Um, and that is about, I think, about five to 700 euros. And then you plug your camera's HDMI port into that. So then you, it means you have to have a camera with an HD, clean HDMI out. So it becomes more and more expensive very quickly. So I believe that the simple trick of putting a plant behind you is much cheaper, okay, and can create an environment that really works. So for me, I have this shitty light. Okay, so how do we make a camera look better? So if we can't make buy an expensive camera, we need to make it look better with what we have. So one of the things to make it look better is have better light, light the subject better, and then also look at what is the camera's focal distance. There's a new one out from Elgato. So if you want to go webcam, that's the only one I so for, I've only recently discovered it, and I like it because it has an f-stop of 2.0. So that means stuff behind me, see there where the, where, the, where the cupboard, where the plank is, is out of focus. And that usually happens when we have an f-stop that is really shallow, all right? So that means my face is in, my face is in focus, but the chair already is out of focus. And that gives us sort of like more the professional look. The next thing is, what do we do with lights? Now, I'm going to quickly switch off the light, show you the lights, and then I'm done, Yonita, okay? So I'm going to quickly have a conversation with the lady on this side. Her name is Alexa. So, Alexa, switch off background. Alexa. 
Alexa, switch off hair. Yeah, that's the hair light. Alexa, switch off background. That doesn't work. I always have a manual override. There we go. So now everything goes grainy because there's not enough light. All right. So the next thing we do is we say, well, we need some light on the subject. Now, to light a subject, um, the first thing we need is a key light. Now, key light creates a pattern on the face. So depending on where I put the light is going to create a pattern. So if I put a light just on the one side of my face, like there, then this side's going to be a shadow. Okay? Half lit. If I shine it from the top, I get a little black little line here that my, no my nose is going to form over my upper lip. So then my the nostrils combined with that little black bit there creates the shape of a butterfly was very popular in the 1950s to light women like that way. You know, horror movies, you'll see them from the 1950s. It's called the butterfly one. And then Rembrandt van Rijn. So the, the guys, when you guys come to Amsterdam to visit me, I'll go take you to Rembrandt studio and you'll see where the window is placed and where he puts his subjects. And the light comes in from the one side so that the tip of the nose casts a shadow just over the cheek here, but it leaves a little bit of a kiss of light on the one side. And that's what I, the one that I like the most. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, how I've set up mine here. Table light, little light, um, key light, here we go. So my camera just needs to quickly adjust. Um, do you see what's happened now? I now have shade on this side of my face. All of a sudden my face looks like it is alive, but I still have the shadows of my glasses over there and for people that wear glasses we know it's always a drama to get the reflections out of our glasses biggest step get anti-glare on your glasses when you buy your glasses just ask them to put an anti-glare coating on it the next one is fill the light get something on this side I, it can be anything just a reflective surface like a white surface and it'll work so when you're in a hotel those, curt those curtains we put around us, the sheets, all right, they become our reflective surfaces as well. We've got that fancy light bulb, and that fancy light bulb we put behind the sheet. So it shines through the sheet, creates some form of diffusion. Now I've put another light up, and this one is now creating a slightly brighter light even than the one I had up before. So now this is turned into my key light. But this one is creating a fill. So this side is not as dark, but I'm getting rid, starting to get rid of some of the shadows. So if the light is 45 degrees up and 45 degrees to my side, it usually doesn't give me a, a, um, a reflection on my glasses. And now you can see my eyes. However, if I put different glasses on that have not been reflectively treated, all of a sudden there's a lot more reflection. Do you see that? Huge difference. And it doesn't cost that much more on your glasses when you have them made. So then the last thing on lighting, um, I just want to switch this on. If you add a light on your hair, all of a sudden people like me with gray hair get lovely sun-kissed color, all right? And it didn't come out of a bottle and I didn't have to pay extra money for it, all right? Bill? We'll talk. It's fine. <laughs> but having a little bit of a sunlight on there creates this warm effect. And all of a sudden, it, it doesn't look as, as, as pale anymore. Right. And then the background, the only reason why I put a background light on is not because I want it in white. But because I want my company colors. So that is the blue. And then on the on that side over there, I have the yellow and the orange. So I bring in my company colors to create my background. And I leave a little bit of space here away from the interest to put company logos or information that I want to share with people. All right. So things we haven't covered today are, are things like playing with sound. Did anybody hear anything there? It was supposed to be a roar. I don't know if you if that came through. <laughs> okay, didn't. All right. So 
not everything always works. So the last thing on lights is size. Size matters when it comes to light. Brightness will illuminate you, will create harsher lines, but the size determines how soft the light will be and wrap around you. See, if you have one light bulb, you have one standing lamp, you don't need more than that. You put it behind a sheet, the distance between the light and the sheet will determine the size of the light because the size of the object determines how well that light, how diffused it will eventually be and light you up. So never put a small light on your face. Make it as big as possible. It's going to look much more natural. Right. So any light from the perspective of your camera looking at you needs to be five times the size of your head. Yeah. That's just the stand, sort of an easy rule to follow. Anyway, that's it because I see time had now as we say in Setswana in the Western Transvaal, time is gone. <laughs>